You know, information. You eat that E. coli, it gets into your stomach, your stomach says, ah, food, hydrochloric acid. Floods the stomach full of hydrochloric acid, E. coli cannot tolerate uh, hydrochloric acid. It gets an acid bath, it's gone, it's dissolved. It's been deprotonated. So, the pylor sphincter opens up, dumps all that food stuff into the small intestine, and you begin to absorb and benefit from all that food. Problem is, though, if you take E. coli that has gone hypervirulent on us because we had it in a polluted environment, like a polluted river or a stockyard, a feedlot, this E. coli will morph and become acid tolerant. Now, when you eat it, and this is what happened in the uh, situation last summer with E. coli getting on the jalapenos, and was it the summer before that that we had it on spinach and lettuce? And this is going to get worse, folks. This is going to get this is going to be a big, big problem. But those E. coli's have gone hypervirulent, and now when you eat them, you can't kill them. They survive the acid bath of your stomach. They get into your intestines, and then they start making toxins that will kill you. And our antibiotics can't hurt them. In fact, our antibiotics can only hurt a tiny percentage of all of the naturally occurring bacteria of soils. Just a tiny percentage. Another example of a hypervirulence of a bacteria is your staph infections in hospitals. That's an epidemic. That's a huge problem. We talked last week, we were at the State Organic uh, uh, Growers Conference in Las Cruces, and there was a pharmacist there from Kerrville, Texas, and he was telling us about a hospital in Kerrville where the staph infections are so bad that something like 70% of the people that go into that hospital get one. And uh, they're going to tear the hospital down in order to solve this problem. They're going to destroy the hospital and rebuild a new hospital. But he said it doesn't matter because you're going to do the same thing. The same people that were working in this hospital are going to take all of their files and their clothing and and their chairs and their desks, and they're going to take it over to the new hospital and contaminate that one, and <laughs> not, not going to solve the problem. You start to ask another question, Gene. No, no, I was. Uh, uh, He's over there. Man, I spent eighty thousand dollars for that compost tea brewer. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, also, I'm going to I'm going to clarify something else about compost tea, if I may. Uh, most of the people who are into compost tea. Talk about keeping it very aerobic, you know, introducing lots of oxygen to it so that you will favor the aerobic bacteria over the non-aerobic bacteria. But you need to know that most of the most dangerous bacteria known to mankind are aerobic bacteria, not anaerobics. They're the aerobic. And if they're not aerobic, they're facultative anaerobes, which means they can go either way. If for some reason the aerobic um, the air oxygen content of that liquid declines, then they simply just switch their metabolism from needing oxygen to make adenosine triphosphate. Adenosine triphosphate is the high energy molecule that we all need in order to live. Everybody makes it. Plants make it through Calvin cycle. Bacteria make it. We make it. Without it, we wouldn't live. ATP. It's a high energy molecule. So bacteria who need that are the aerobic bacteria can only do it with oxygen present. The anaerobic bacteria can't do it with oxygen. In fact, it'll stop them. It'll kill them. They need a totally oxygen-free environment. And in the middle, we have our facultative anaerobes who will do it either way. They'll switch on us. They're the survivors. An example of a, a facultative anaerobe is going to be mm, E. coli, uh, listeria, cholera, salmonella, botulism. You've all heard of those. You can't kill them in a compost tea environment by keeping it charged full of oxygen. In fact, you're just going to encourage them. You're putting lots of food in there in the form of dissolved organics. They love that stuff. <coughs> and then you're going to agitate it and stir them around. And they're going to love that even more. So if, if they were in the compost, they're going to be in the compost heap. You cannot exclude them. Unfortunately, most of the people who are out there looking through microscopes and saying, oh yeah, there's squiggly things in there, swimming around, you know, good compost heap. 
they're not really looking at who are these squiggly things. You know, there's only a few basic shapes and sizes of bacteria, rods, spheres, and so forth, out of tens of thousands of species of bacteria. There's only a few shapes, and so you cannot identify accurately bacteria by looking at them under a microscope. You've got to do a DNA extraction. And nobody is doing DNA. Well, that's not true. Uh, Dr. Pino at Dynatech Labs in El Paso does DNA extractions. If you're willing to pay him the fee, he'll do it, and he'll tell you who they are. It's expensive. So disinfect your compost tea, dump some hydrogen peroxide in there. You know, if you have 100 gallons of compost tea, you probably need to put about, uh, using a 33% solution of hydrogen peroxide, which is very dangerous stuff, uh, probably want to put about a cup in there. And that will wipe out all the bacteria, leaving behind all the, vent, the, the ionized uh, cations and anions that were in the compost. And now you have something you can go out and spray. Okay. Water sequestering, again, part of the process of humus is, it, it alone can grab water and hold on to it so it doesn't evaporate and doesn't leach. We know from research that when you introduce humus into a normally uh, barren soil like a desert sand or a desert clay, you can increase the drought tolerance of that landscape dramatically, probably greater than 30%. Mycorrhizae can do it by greater than 30% too. And we have thousands and thousands of people.